let's take a look at one of Boston's most violent eras. Beantown, we know, is notable for many things, including its Irish pride and history of pro sports. But it also has multiple eras where violence was front and center. Before Whitey Bulger and his infamous partnership with the FBI, there was a time when the streets were getting soaked and stained with the blood of criminal figures during the period of the Boston Irish Gang War. The Gang War, which started on the weekend of Labor Day 1961, lasted for more than half a decade until its end in 1967. This war was the event that significantly influenced the eventual formation and rise of the Winter Hill Gang. The war was fought between the Bernie McLaughlin-led gang from the neighborhood of Charlestown and the Winter Hill Gang led by James Buddy McLean. The Winter Hill Gang itself, named after the Winter Hill neighborhood of Somerville, Massachusetts, was a loose confederation of organized crime figures sprinkled throughout the Boston area. The gang was predominantly composed of Irish Americans. The Winter Hill Gang was originally founded by James Buddy McLean. He led his crew until his death in 1965. The Boston Irish Gang War involved several individuals aside from the main players at the time, including John McIntyre, a Winter Hill associate who was involved in gun running and drug smuggling. McIntyre was arrested for drunk driving and later offered to provide information about the gang. His involvement led to a raid on an at-sea drug transfer, which resulted in the seizure of large quantities of marijuana. McIntyre was later murdered, and his body was not found and identified for 16 years. Pat Nee, a Winter Hill associate who was involved in the drug and gun running operations, Nee later detailed these activities in a book discussing Bolger's association with the Irish Republican Army, the IRA, and its legitimization of his criminal activities. Nee's account provided insights into the gang's connections and criminal operations. Then William McArdle, a Winter Hill associate connected to the gang's activities. McArdle was associated with the Winter Hill Gang during the turbulent period of the Boston Irish Gang War. Stephen Hughes and Sammy Lindenbaum. Both were prominent members of the McLaughlin Gang and were eventually killed during the conflict. The Hughes brothers were known as efficient killers from Charlestown and their deaths were part of the violent confrontations between the rival gangs. The conflict itself began over a personal dispute. One night, George McLaughlin, a member of the McLaughlin gang, made an inappropriate advance on the girlfriend of Alex Rocco, a member of the Winter Hill gang. As a result of the disrespectful act by George, McLaughlin was profusely beaten by members of the Winter Hill gang. Bernie McLaughlin, George's brother, and the leader of the gang immediately went and sought an explanation from the Winter Hill leader, Buddy McLean. When McLean refused to turn over any of the men who had beaten George, the McLaughlins attempted to wire a bomb to McLean's wife's car in an act of revenge. Then McLean, in retaliation for the attempted bombing, shot and killed Bernie McLaughlin, marking the beginning of the Boston Irish Gang War. The war was characterized by a series of violent confrontations and murders. By the time the war ended, more than 60 men had been murdered throughout Boston and the surrounding area. The war allowed the Winter Hill Gang to consolidate its power in Boston. One of the future implications of the Boston Irish Gang War was that it laid the groundwork for the rise of the most notable and notorious Boston mobster, James Whitey Bulger, who spent most of the war locked up in prison and the rest of it on the sidelines. The war ended with the death of the last two associates of the McLaughlin Gang, that being two brothers. Connie and Stephen Hughes. After the war ended, the Winter Hill Gang emerged as the dominant Irish mob syndicate in the New England area. However, they initially struggled with running these operations, particularly in the realm of gambling. After McLean's death, Howie Winter took over leadership of the gang. But eventually, as we all know, the gang's most infamous era began in 1979 when James Jimmy Whitey Bulger took over its leadership and the rest was history. Thomas Patera, known as Tommy Karate, was born on December 2nd, 1954 in Brooklyn, New York. His parents were first-generation Italian immigrants from Salerno, and he grew up in the Gravesend neighborhood of Brooklyn. Patera faced constant and relentless bullying during his childhood years due to his high-pitched voice, which led to physical attacks and public humiliation. This experience had a traumatizing and profound impact on him igniting a fire within that would later manifest in all of his violent tendencies. 
Patera's fascination with martial arts began at the easily impressionable age of 12 when he was directly inspired by the television show The Green Hornet and actor Bruce Lee. He was particularly drawn to the character of Kato, played by Bruce Lee, which fueled his pursuit of martial arts training. Patera attended a dojo in Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn, where he excelled due to his vigor and dedication, which quickly pushed him to the top of his class. It would be an understatement to say his dedication to his craft was intense. It was his life mission during that phase. He followed a strict regimen of working out, lifting weights, consistently studying fighting strategies and watching martial arts films. His enthusiasm and commitment took him around the world, all the way to Japan where he immersed himself in the culture of his new community and trained in toga ryu a form of ninjutsu rather than karate. And please know I do apologize if I didn't pronounce that correctly. During his time in Japan, Patera adopted a strict diet of rice and edible seaweed to fuel his desire of peak health. He also read extensively about war and fighting and trained with traditional weapons such as the tonfa, nunchucks, and katanas. This period in his life marked a significant transformation in his maturity and sensibility, as noted by his mother and aunt during their visit to him in Japan. Upon returning to Brooklyn, Patera's martial arts skills and intimidating presence caught the attention of the Banano crime family. He worked himself into the Bonanno family's Lino crew after impressing Anthony Sparrow and soon after established himself as a feared enforcer and hitman. Despite his clever witty nickname, Tommy Karate, it was actually his expertise in Toga Ryu that made him a formidable and polarizing figure in the streets of the underworld. Patera's criminal career was characterized by extreme violence and brutality. It would be hard to dispute that he didn't enjoy violence. I personally get the feeling that he had a hunger for it. This would have undoubtedly created a barrier to forming close trusting relationships because those around him would be aware of the potential consequences of falling out of favor with him. The fear he instilled in others through his brutal methods of enforcing discipline and eliminating rivals would have made it difficult for him to lead a normal personal life too. He reminds me of a more physically skilled and obviously healthier version of the infamous Roy DeMeo because they both lusted after the blood of others. We know he took personal pleasure in the disappearances of others, so much so that he would keep trophies from his victims, such as wedding rings, just like a serial killer would. He certainly didn't discriminate either as he would prey on anyone he perceived as a threat, including friends and even members of his own crew. Patera was also heavily involved in drug trafficking, and he did not hesitate to eliminate dealers or anyone who might compromise his operations or profits. But again, that was minimal compared to his more serious crimes. With that said, law enforcement, in fact, suspected Patera of being involved in as many as possibly 60 hits and disappearances. On August 29, 1988, Patera allegedly attacked and took the life of Wilfred Willie Boy Johnson. Johnson was a longtime associate of the Gambino's boss, John Gotti. Patera and Vincent Kojak Giatino killed Willie Boy because John Gotti had found out that Willie Boy had been a rat since 1966. Patera was charged with taking Johnson's life, but he was acquitted during his trial. His methods of disposal usually involved dismemberment to make it challenging for law enforcement to solve the crimes and link them back to him, which ultimately led to him committing violent crimes with a diabolical confidence. I believe he may have felt untouchable. Patera also took the life of Tala Siksik, a Middle Eastern drug mover, in his own apartment. Investigators eventually found six of Patera's victims in a mob graveyard in Staten Island near the William T. Davis Wildlife Refuge. You don't take part in violence like that without a superiority complex, at least not in my opinion. He became the thing he hated most as a child. He became a bully, a pure victimizer with almost no signs of compassion or empathy. Patera's reign of terror came to an end in 1990 when he was arrested after a three-year investigation by the DEA led by Assistant Special Agent Jim Hunt. It was found Patera's crew sold over 200 pounds of illegal substances and marijuana on average per year. FBI agents discovered several automatic weapons, knives, swords, and books such as the Hitman's Handbook and Kill or Be Killed, which were about assassination techniques. In 1992, Tommy Karate Patera was convicted on multiple charges, including murder and drug trafficking, based on the testimony of former associates and physical evidence. One of those witnesses was the nephew of Genovese family capo Rosario Ganji, who had decided to testify against Patera. Frank had been arrested for driving under the influence. While so, he confessed to all the murders he was involved in with Patera and provided detailed info on other Patera crimes. 
He described how Patera took the life of Ganji's girlfriend, Phyllis Birdie, and Mark Kacharski during a fight. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole and is currently serving his sentence at the USP Big Sandy in Kentucky. Tommy Patera's martial arts prowess could have been a source of discipline, something he used for self-improvement, or a tool that he could have used to enlighten other people. But instead, he became an instrument of terror, an orchestrator of chaos, a tool that was always at the hands of the Bonanno crime family, whenever it was indeed time for violence or to put somebody back in line. And if I must say so myself, he is not someone you want to kick it with. There's something about the former president of the United States, Richard Nixon, and his complex relationship with the one-time Teamsters president, James Jimmy Hoffa, that managed to fixate a group of thieves from Ohio into planning a robbery all the way in California. And we're gonna find out why. First, let's take a look back at some of the history between Nixon and Hoffa for a bit of context. From what I could find, they developed a professional and political relationship starting in the 1950s. Jimmy Hoffa was clearly a large leading force behind the typical voting direction of his union members, making him a powerful ally for those running for office, especially a presidential candidate. This was a time when our country, from a political standpoint, still respected the hard-working hands of our blue-collar communities. A time where the influence of politics wasn't always driven through the scope of corporations and rich donors with large interest groups that could pound away with the media and smearing the working class. We used to celebrate labor workers for their essential work and backbreaking jobs that still to this day make the world go around like those of truckers and bricklayers. So their votes were appreciated and essential to all candidates on both sides of the political spectrum. With their working relationship intact, Jimmy Hoffa agreed to back Richard Nixon for president during the presidential campaigns in 1960. James Hoffa's support came with an alleged gift of money totaling $1 million in the form of two $500,000 payments in cash being delivered to the former president. That wasn't all. It's also alleged that in 1971, Jimmy Hoffa had another 300,000 sent as a bribe to Richard Nixon again, this time to commute Hoffa's prison sentence, which he was serving for ironically misusing Teamster funds and jury tampering. We now know that there are rumors swirling around of large cash deposits in the United California Bank belonging to Richard Nixon, some that illegally came from Jimmy Hoffa. And if that wasn't enough, there was another rumor that emerged. A rumor supposedly coming from Hoffa himself, stating that there could be up to 30 million in total stashed at the same bank. Now, we officially know the reason for the thieves wanting to target a bank in California. They heard rumors that the bank they wanted to rob was the location of the illicit cash payments from Hoffa to Nixon, along with the other influx of money that was stashed there. And it was believed that the money was locked in safe deposit boxes in the vault. I'm not a math person, but if the 30 million is accurate, then back in 1972, that would have been close to the equivalent of about 243 million in today's dollars. Again, I tried to make sure the numbers were accurate, and if they aren't, I do apologize. That's ultimately where Emil Denzio decided to step in. Denzio was a career criminal, a master thief who was born in 1936 in the town of Groshen, Ohio. Denzio was described as being one of the most successful thieves in the history of the United States. Emil had a crew that was composed of typically him, his brother James Denzio, and their brother-in-law Charles Mulligan. Emil was an incredibly skilled alarm expert and his brother James was efficient in building bombs and using explosives. Emil Denzio had an interesting life to say the least, being convicted of several crimes through the years, even as recently as the 1990s for a robbery attempt, which was his last time, far past the intriguing history of this story. So finally, Let's get to 1972 when a thoroughly planned heist equally rocked federal law enforcement in the city of Laguna Niguel, California. We have the already noted Denzio brothers and their brother-in-law Charles, the getaway driver on board. But for this job, they needed to add some expertise so they got their nephews Harry and Ronald Barber involved, as well as Phil Christopher, who was another alarm expert, and Charles Brokel. Brokel was brought on purely for strength in numbers as he possessed no real skill. They knew the planning had to be intricate as this was the crime that would become their legacy. Emil had received numerous tips including the supposed numbers for the security deposit boxes. And with that final detail of confidence, they decided it was time to make their move so they traveled to Nigel Laguna from Ohio and began casing the bank. Upon their planning, 
They realized it would best be served in their favor to go through the roof into the vault which would limit their risk of public exposure. Going through the roof was something that Emil and his brother James had perfected. They hit various scores through the years with numbers very much in the double digits as the brotherly duo were sincerely veterans in their field. With the complex logistics locked down, they decided to put their plans into action. The Thursday night before, they delivered their tools to the eventual scene of their crime. They then injected the alarm systems with an expanding foam to keep the clapping piece from tripping and alerting the authorities. Finally, it's Friday night on March 24th, 1972 and the crew is ready to strike. In first order, they plant dynamite on top of the bank's vault. They blow it open and scale down in. They immediately start busting open safe deposit boxes and quickly come across large amounts of cash, gold, and valuables. The totals of cash and value were adding up, but they ultimately found themselves well short of that elusive $30 million. And that is certainly not to undermine the total estimate of $9 million that they did get away with, while again considering the time was equivalent to a far larger amount than what $9 million is now presently. They quickly gather what they've stolen and they head back out under the blankets at night. The scene was eventually discovered, and it only baffled law enforcement. It was a testament to the detail and skills that each individual possessed in their role. It was a sign that these were true professionals with experience. This escalated into a frustrating case rather swiftly for the FBI, as the Denzio crew had almost committed a perfect crime, leaving no physical evidence to tie any of the robbers to the scene itself. That was until the FBI was able to link two robberies with similar tactics back to the explosive bandits back in Ohio. The feds found what they believed to be the place where they planned their criminal acts, in relation to one of the barber nephews. When the FBI searched the place, they found fingerprints on dirty dishes that they were able to trace back and match to the bandits. Warrants were eventually pushed out, the robbers were tracked down and soon picked up. Emil and James Denzio, Charles Mulligan, their nephews, Ronald and Harry, along with Phil Christopher, were all arrested. But good old Charles Brokel decided to rat on his partners in crime before entering the witness protection program. This crime was considered so brilliant that it has been romanticized in film and television, even as recently as 2019 in the film Finding Steve McQueen. Emil Denzio's acts didn't stop there, though. But I'm going to deep dive into his life story on its own. I truly hope you all enjoyed another interesting tale about bandits blowing up stuff. I appreciate you watching, and thank you for your time. The Southern California area is full of freeways, including the famous 405, giving robbers, crooks, and thieves of all sorts the various getaway routes that are essential to their master plans. A favorable place, if you will, if something needs doing that requires a quick exit. And by the 1980s, the Los Angeles area had become our country's bank robbing hub. See, bank robbery rates were skyrocketing across the nation, but even so, Southern Cali was still seeing an average higher than anywhere else, even with the inflated national numbers. And 1980 itself wound up a peak year for the bank robbing scene down on the lower west coast. It was the year that Norco, a prideful American town outside of Los Angeles, was set under siege when a religious fanatic and his crew decided to paint the streets red on the fateful and deadly day of May 9th. Now for context, we need to go back a little bit to the 1960s and 70s when fear was motivated in some people by the caution of a possible societal collapse due to the radical actions that had swept through the country the previous two decades, when liberation and radical groups were operating in full frontal public view. For example, the early 70s were a violent time that included serious acts of extremism, including a total of well over 2,000 bombings. This is also coming from a time where the thought of nuclear war was burned into people's minds, fueling a further paranoia. There was constant tension and propaganda everywhere, kind of like today, just minus the social media. It's not hard to imagine people being caught in extremism like this. The age of the internet has just helped spread sporadic extremist ideas faster than back then, but it hasn't changed the fact that people are still radicalized sometimes rather easily. You'll soon see how extremism drove these five armed individuals to follow through with their plan to rob a bank. Extremist ideologies have always spread and they always will, unfortunately. I know, I'm from Oklahoma City and I will never forget the horrific acts committed by a man that was brainwashed and driven by extremist ideologies. 
You all are familiar with April 19, 1995, which took the lives of 168 people, including several children. Now, let me introduce the eventual mastermind of this robbery, George Smith. He was once a military man who served for a couple of years overseas in Germany working with artillery. He was in his late 20s and someone who for a long time held strong atheist beliefs. He rejected societal norms, including religion, but that eventually changed with him becoming a Christian during the religious youth movements from his era, leading him into an obsession with the rapture and the apocalypse. Now listen, I'm not saying Christianity is extremism. Let me clarify that before I upset anyone. But almost all belief systems and cultures do typically have some form of an extremist subculture, which is what George's beliefs quickly escalated towards. He was able to sway people with his extreme biblical beliefs and apocalyptic prepping propaganda. Because of such, a man named Chris Harvin, who George worked with, was soon intrigued by him. I mean, Chris was absolutely captivated by George Smith. You could basically say they eventually built a platonic life with one another when they bought a house together in Mariloma. I'm not insinuating anything intimate between the two, nothing intimate that I've found. I know it was more of just a kindred spiritual vision that brought them closer than blood. Their bond over the world possibly imploding into an orderless society of chaos was like mixing baking soda and vinegar. It was bound to explode before eventually fizzling out. Chris Harvin was now swayed with George. George Smith's preaching was simple. As a former dreamer of anarchy, he went through a metamorphosis, trading his furious rebellion for a religious fixation preaching that almost every single action should benefit one's need of preparation for the impending rapture or a possible nuclear showdown between the United States and the Soviet Union. And George's plans were originally just as simple, reject society, prep for doomsday, and cash in on their marijuana harvest. But the harvest didn't work out. Now, past the radical 60s and 70s, there was another boom sweeping our nation, the bank robbing boom was now being felt up and down the streets like an earthquake and it wasn't showing any signs of slowing down. So couple the bank robbing boom with George Smith and Chris Harvin's obsession with the apocalypse and the failure of their marijuana revenue together and you get some desperate men ready to raise the stakes for the money they need to fund their doomsday prepper lifestyle. Which almost sounds like something that would become a reality show nowadays. Their financial desperation and religious paranoia quickly led them down the road of planning a bank robbery on George's orders, and their first order of action was now to start recruiting. Soon after, the crew was set, including George Smith, the one-time artillery hotshot now turned apocalyptic preacher as their boastful leader, Chris Harvin, George's trusty cliché sidekick, the Delgado brothers, composed of Billy and Manny, and finally Russell Harvin, Chris's brother. George was obviously the man that was going to be responsible for planning their operation as well as building the bombs, which were IEDs. They began their preparations for the robbery with Smith casing the bank in its layout. He was orchestrating a plan to be in and out within two minutes and not a single second more. They began stockpiling weapons and ammo, from shotguns to rifles. Russell and the Delgado brothers were tasked with stealing a van, which they eventually stole from Gary Hakala after kidnapping him in a mall parking lot. With their weapons and getaway vehicles secured and ready, they were excited to set their plan in motion. The first act was to set the bomb off close to the site of the robbery beforehand and create a diversion, before the final act of actually robbing the bank. The days arrived. It's May 9th, 1980. They set out on their way a little after three in the afternoon, armed and vigilant. First, the robbers stop and they plant the bomb. They realize it's not gonna detonate, but with desperation at hand, they decide to go ahead with the rest of their plan without the diversion. The men arrive at Security Pacific Bank Branch covered from head to toe, barge to the front doors with their guns cocked and ready for action. Russell Harvin forces an employee to the vault and gathers some cash while the others dictate the customers in the lobby area. They wind up with around $20,000 without firing a shot inside the bank. With their two minutes up, they quickly exit but as luck had it, there were police in the immediate area that were already responding to calls nearby. Deputy Belaski, arriving first, immediately started taking gunfire and returning it back at the bandits who were unleashing automatic rounds. Belaski struck George Smith in the lower body and hit Billy in the neck. Billy was now gone, leaving the rest of the crew with no getaway driver. 
the robbers still firing, eventually struck Belaski, severely injuring him as Deputies Hill and Deputy Delgado arrived, not to be confused with the criminal Delgado brothers. The deputies were able to save Belaski and get him away from the ongoing storm of bullets. From there, the group of robbers hijacked another vehicle and started exchanging gunfire with Deputy Delgado again. With all the violence immediately ensuing after the robbery, the money wound up left behind. The robbers were now empty-handed with only their lives to fight for. During the pursuit, the robbers showed no remorse for anyone in their way including civilians and law enforcement. Another victim of gunfire that day during the street pursuit was Deputy Parks, who was able to survive. For context, the robbers did say that they didn't intend to hurt the police, as they were just trying to take their vehicles out but they injured almost a dozen people including a child during the chase. And as if things couldn't get crazier, the crew of heavily armed bandits started shooting at a police helicopter that was aiding in the pursuit. Bullets struck the helicopter and it had to make an emergency landing. The robbers kept fleeing and headed towards Little Creek Canyon in the San Gabriel Mountains. Unfortunately though, tragedy is about to strike. As more police units had joined the pursuit, a one deputy Jim Evans was closing in. Jim Evans was a decorated ex-military service member and proud member of law enforcement. As he approached their vehicle, the robbers took position and outgunned the deputy, taking his life, solidifying their fate as cop killers. As soon as they ended their attack on the fallen Jim Evans, they turned their attention towards Deputy Jim McCarty, who originally was behind Jim. McCarty had an automatic weapon and was able to defend himself against the crew of killers until reinforcements showed up. After a day of shootouts and now on the run in the wilderness, George was starting to weaken due to blood loss from all of his injuries. Finally, SWAT closed in and apprehended the criminals without nearly any more conflict. George Smith and the Harvin brothers gave up without any further fight, but Manny Delgado, still armed, was taken out by SWAT members. The remaining suspects were now in custody with only tire tracks, bullet casings, and blood littering their trail. All three remaining robbers, George Smith, Chris Harvin, and Russell Harvin were charged with several crimes, leaving all of them with life sentences in prison. May 9th, 1980 was a day that was paved into the streets and the hearts of all those negatively affected. Because when violent crimes happen, there's usually victims with families. It's the families that ultimately pay the price. I really appreciate you watching and listening. I hope you enjoyed this true but tragic story of real life cops and robbers. Whether you love it or hate it, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania is a city that's always taken pride in being a hub for the blue collar and rugged workers that don't mind getting their hands dirty. Well, the same could be said about Philly's mafia. The city of brotherly love has rarely lived up to that moniker on the streets as its mob history has painted a different story plagued by major wars between criminal figures and families since the early 1900s. But gangsters in the headlines were no less common than the score from last night's Phillies game. The history of the Philadelphia Mafia has been littered with notorious and fascinating figures from John Stanford to Angelo Bruno. Today we're going to start with one of the first big names to stroll those streets, and that was Salvatore Sabella. Sabella was a key figure and leading up to the first major mob war in Philly, and we're gonna find out why. Let's go back to Sicily, where Salvatore Sabella was born on July 7th, 1891, in Castellamare del Golfo. In his teen years, he began working a butcher shop. Unfortunately for him, he worked for a man who was incredibly violent and ill-tempered. I'm assuming that the abuse from his employer weighed on him, because Sabella wound up taking that man's life. Now, I couldn't find if there was an immediate conflict that led up to this or if it was just Sabella finally snapping under the constant pressure of a known abuser. But regardless of why, Salvatore was convicted and sentenced to three years for the crime, which he served in Italy. That is thought to be the period that Sabella decided to initiate his ascension into organized crime. Soon after prison, he went to New York and settled in Brooklyn. Once he was there, he started running with the Salvatore Di Aquila crew where he met Giuseppe Trainer. Trainer took a liking to young Sabella. This led to Trainer tailoring Sabella into someone that could be a leader, someone who could head a crew. He saw potential that he wanted to exploit. By 1919, Sabella had proven his worth and went down to Philadelphia to set up and lead operations on behalf of their crime-based organization. He would run fronts to cover their activities, which fell in line with the country's typical crimes during that era, like bootlegging. From there, he added to his body count 
eventually being tried for the deaths of Vincent Kokosa and Joseph Zengi. He was eventually acquitted of the crimes, but it didn't go without punishment as he was deported back to his native country. That was until the Castle of Marese War, which brought Salvatore Sabella back to the United States, where he took the side of Maranzano against Mazzaria in the conflict. When the war ended in 1931 with the death of Mazzaria, Sabella returned to Philly again shortly after, taking the reins back over from acting boss John Avena. However, that stint was shorter than Tony Soprano's temper, and Salvatore abruptly retired from organized crime. Some believe the Castle of Marese war took a toll on him, but who really knows? Either way, he got to retire and live out the rest of his life on his own terms, which is unusual for a mobster. Because usually, there were only three variables, being death, prison, or snitching. So kudos to Mr. Sabella for getting out while he still could. In fact, he lived until 1962 where he died from the most unnatural mobster death, being that of natural causes. Sabella's retirement in 1931 was the precursor to the first Philadelphia mob war because now there was a power grab. So by 1932, the escalating tension following Sabella's retirement was in full swing due to the ambitions of his former lieutenants, John Avena and Giuseppe Dovi, as both had an appetite for power and control. John Avena, once acting boss, was Sabella's one-time underling that was supposed to become the eventual and permanent boss. Avena had been someone that most associates thought fondly of as a foundational piece of the faction. He was someone who built relationships with other ethnic criminal groups, expanding the likes of profit. A true believer of financial progression without barrier. Giuseppe Dovi, also known as Joe Bruno Dovi, was another one of the central figures in the conflict. Though not to contradict what I said earlier, it was kind of murky as to whether Dovi was immediately at odds with John Avena personally for leadership but it is assumed that Dovi also wanted the role of being the boss. Most importantly, in my opinion, though, are the Lanzetta brothers, not Lanzetti, which has incorrectly been given to them through the years. Led by Leo Lanzetta, the crew included his brothers Pius, Ignatius, Hugo, Willie, Lucian, and Tio, who mainly operated out of South Philly. For context, it should be noted that Leo was actually killed in 1925 in retaliation for the death of a different Joe Bruno, who was a rival bootlegger, and Leo's killer was thought to possibly be none other than Salvatore Sabella. Now, the Lanzettas were a volatile bunch of siblings that seemed to have had a beef with basically everyone from other Italians and Sicilians, as well as Jewish gangsters and Irish crews too, and they were thought to have been involved in at least 15 total killings between them all. As the war waged into the mid-1930s, the Lanzetta brothers were ready to turn the tides. They decided they were going to step in and lend the eventual helping hand to Joe Bruno Dovi. They did so on August 17, 1936, by orchestrating a drive-by shooting and assassinating John Avena. This was the turning point that handed the eventual power to Giuseppe Joe Bruno Dovi. Dovi wound up becoming a competent and great successor to Sabella's criminal organization, as he helped expand their rackets into Atlantic City, New Jersey, as well as other places outside of South Philly. That was in fact the beginning of a new era of crime that was coming to Philadelphia under the leadership of Dovey. As by the late 1930s, the majority of the Lanzetta brothers were dead or in prison. The brothers themselves were wild cards. Having them gone along with Avena paved the way for Dovey to expand without caution. Dovey remained boss for a decade, then he passed away of natural causes too. I never thought I'd tell a mob story about a war where at least two guys die of natural causes. Personally, I would attest that to not only his luck, but intelligence as well. I mean, to navigate a life of violent criminals and daily deadly business deeds while going out somewhat on your own terms is pretty impressive itself. At least I think so. As for this war, it was far from the bloodiest on the list of the Philly Mafia conflicts, but it was a foundation for the groundwork of violence that the future would behold any time there were disagreements and beefs. The Philadelphia underworld has always been one that acted first and sometimes didn't even ask questions later. Instead, it's always been a smorgasbord of trigger-happy gangsters, ready to forecast a storm of bullets at the first sign of any rival opposition. As a whole, I have a fascinating love for the history of the mob in Philly. They've always struck me as the more rebellious families, more so than the already typical mob type. I was always the black sheep in my family, so I can relate a little bit. Anyways, 
Thank you for walking in and falling into this teeny tiny rabbit hole about the first major mafia war in Philadelphia. I do very much appreciate it. And I hope it leads you to more of my content as well as the awesome content from the other crime creators on YouTube. Have a great day. Chicago is famous for many reasons. To sports fans, it's the home of the legacy that surrounds Michael Jordan and the 1990s Bulls dynasty. To creatives, it's a city with a rich performing arts history including the likes of jazz savant Satchmo Armstrong, a true pioneer in the renaissance in that genre of music. And also, not without mention, the theater district to this day still brandishes its excessive star power. The same way these same streets were brandishing gangsters that were likened to celebrities during the Prohibition era. There's no need for me to drop a monologue about who Al Capone was. However, his most famous deed may not have been his deed at all. Maybe, just maybe, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre wasn't orchestrated by the man known as Scarface. Though it's widely regarded as Capone's work, there have been interesting theories and evidence uncovered through the years that could point in different directions. So let's take a small trip into these theories and figure out what conclusion we can come to in the end. So when talking about the criminal history of Chicago, it's impossible to ignore prohibition. Those times have been continuously romanticized in all forms of media, movies especially, and for different reasons, not always for the criminal lore. But that era though, is and always will be associated with extremely heightened levels of violence in the real world with an emphasis on the East Coast and Midwest. Chicago was a smorgasbord of criminal figures who were soaked with the spoils of rum running and distilling alcohol. They were drunk off the profits, you might say. <laughs> Sorry, you may have to ignore my almost funny but not funny quips. I like to keep myself entertained when writing these scripts, you know. But with the streets in New York already in shambles over who was going to control what rackets there, Chi-Town had begun to suffer from its own brewing problems. Get it? Brewing? All right, I'm sorry again. No, but seriously, the violence from Prohibition was a mainstay on the front pages of papers being hustled by the boys always screaming to read all about it. Violence itself was as much as a known taboo as the alcohol the gangsters were peddling. It was a nasty mix. You could almost guarantee that someone's blood had been spilled for the drink you were now sipping. Whether it was a week ago or a day ago, along the way, somebody somehow got hurt for that alcohol. Let's move on to the supposed central figures of this tragic event. As most know, the massacre itself has always been linked to the bloody feud for control over the Windy City rackets between a one Bugs Moran and Al Capone, the latter being the one accused. However, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre is actually an unsolved crime to this day. There was never enough evidence to charge Capone, let alone to get a conviction for it. There doesn't even seem to be anything to directly link him to the crime in any aspect, not outside of someone just pointing the finger at him. And with that, we'll jump into the first theory not involving Capone. So for context, on February 14th, 1929, in the early morning hours, it was alleged that what looked like a Cadillac pulled up outside of the garage where the massacre occurred, and that a couple of men dressed like cops as well as a few others got out and proceeded to go into the garage. And inside were Johnny May, Frank and Peter Gusenberg, Albert Kachalek, Adam Hayer, Albert Weinshank and Reinhard H. Swimmer, whom were all associates of the Moran Gang, both criminals and civilians alike as Johnny was just a mechanic and Swimmer was a doctor. The criminal associates of Moran that were present had guns, but strangely, they were never drawn which was credited to the arriving assailants dressed like cops. The assailants pulled out a shotgun and automatic weapons as they placed the Moran associates against the wall before executing them. People nearby heard the shots, before seeing the assailants fleeing the scene in the earlier mentioned Cadillac, a neighbor decided to approach the crime scene and found Frank Gusenberg still clinging to life while the other men were all deceased, even though he himself was suffering from 14 gunshot wounds. Soon, policeman Thomas J. Leptis arrived and asked Frank who did it, and before he was taken to a hospital where he died, he told Tom Loftus that cops did it. I know the details seem the same so far as cops or men dressed as cops were always fingered as being trigger men responsible. But here's where things take a turn. As known, Capone was down south in Florida at the time of the shootings where he was actually meeting with a prosecutor. Maybe it was an alibi and maybe it wasn't. But what we do know now is this. Back north in Chicago, U.S. Attorney George E.Q. Johnson was a bull leading with his horns while going after Capone. On top of that, 
Investigators from multiple organizations were interviewing potential witnesses and scanning the streets for that supposed but elusive black Cadillac that may have been the vehicle connected to the massacre. Some investigators believed that maybe it was a simple retaliatory act towards Frank Gusenberg, as he and his brother had a reputation for being violent criminals who encroached on others. Then it was considered a possibility that the Purple Gang out of Detroit were responsible as they were hunting for the people who they thought were responsible for hijacking some of their illicit loads recently. Then they considered that maybe it was a hit on Albert Weinshank, who was dominating the laundry rackets, and maybe it was just a way to remove him personally and the other victims were just collateral damage. Finally, the investigators came back to Frank Gusenberg's last words, proclaiming the shooting was done by cops because they found that a crooked cop had a truckload of liquor hijacked recently and he had been looking for revenge too. That went along with another witness swearing without a doubt that it was not a plain black Cadillac, but instead it was a police cruiser. That fell apart as investigators found that theory fizzling due to the fact that even crooked cops probably wouldn't have executed the two innocent men, and also, nothing was stolen, not even the money present at the crime scene. That comes off as an act of angry violence as opposed to a robbery or something business related. At least that's the way it was perceived through their investigation. With dead ends in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre investigation and in generally prosecuting Capone, the pressure was beginning to mount on A.G. Johnson and the pressure was coming directly from none other than Herbert Hoover. It's speculated that at one point Hoover and Johnson considered pinning the massacre on Capone just to get him off the streets of Chicago, but fortunately for Capone that didn't happen. Then several months later, in December of 1929, there was a confrontation between police and a known killer in Michigan named Frank Burke. Burke wound up taking the life of a police officer during the encounter, but he was able to evade capture, and during the search for Burke, police located several arms and ammunition belonging to him. Among those weapons, police eventually found ballistics from some of those guns matching the same weapons used in the massacre. However, Burke never admitted whether he did the deed for Capone or how long he had the guns and so he was never charged with anything related to the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. But he was charged in 1931 for the death of the earlier mentioned officer. But in 1935, a full U-turn was forced onto the investigators as a now in custody bank robber named Byron Bolton claimed that he and four other men performed the assassination directly on the orders of Al Capone. But baffled again, the evidence didn't add up from Bolton's story as he was likely just trying to reduce his sentence for robbery by claiming Capone was guilty of the crime. With most hope lost, there was eventually a discovery of a letter written by Frank Farrell. He was writing to J. Edgar Hoover in response to the ongoing coverage of Byron Bolton's story about Al Capone being the orchestrator of the massacre. The letter claimed that Bill Davern Jr., the son of a policeman, was shot during a confrontation at a bar. Davern Jr. made it to a hospital where he was able to survive for a few weeks. During his time there, he told his cousin, whom he was incredibly close with, that the men who shot him were Frank Gusenberg and his associates. He didn't specify who shot him directly, and maybe he just couldn't. William Three Fingered Jack White was Davern Jr.'s cousin, and he was a criminal with a horrid reputation, and the letter states that he vowed to get revenge for the death of his cousin. That answered the question as to why the criminals didn't try and fight back or pull out their weapons. William White knew crooked cops, and he more than likely brought on William Davern Sr., the father of the victim again, and also a cop to help avenge the life of Bill Jr. White was eventually arrested and began cooperating, and there are rumors that the investigators eventually found out that William White and William Sr., as well as another cop, were guilty of the massacre, ultimately leading them to protect their informant and fellow police officers altogether pushing it under the rug and allowing Al Capone to take the blame from the media's perspective. Personally, the conclusion I have is that William White and the actual cops committed the crime. I know this crime is infamously tied to Al Capone. I know the signs point in the direction of the street beefs between Capone and Moran at the time, but it's hard to believe that even back then, the massacre of seven men, including two innocent ones, would go unsolved, especially when you factor in how pressure was pushed down on the attorney general and you also have to think about Herbert Hoover's reputation. It's hard to fathom that those two men, prominent in their positions of power, would allow a notorious killer and gangster like Al Capone to continue living life in the free world after an execution that dominated the public's imagination. 
I obviously don't know, but I like the last theory. I genuinely enjoyed researching this because I was unfamiliar with the theories that surrounded the case. I was oblivious to them, as I was under the same impression as a lot of folks that Capone was guilty, but just never charged. I know Frank Burke was caught with weapons tied to the crime, but that happens to this day as guns are easily trafficked between crimes. Ultimately, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre carries some mystique the same way that Jimmy Hoffa's disappearance did, at least in my eyes. I enjoy mysteries, especially ambiguous ones. On one hand, the lack of closure can be frustrating, but at the same time, it always leaves even the slightest bit of wavering hope that a new truth may find its way to the surface of public view. We can only hope though, right? As always, I appreciate you joining me on another journey into the world of criminal figures. Though this story never had the chance to end with a definitive answer, the speculation of these theories will only add to its legend. So please, let me know down below what theory you believe, whether it be the one favoring Capone's involvement, or maybe you believe William White was simply avenging his cousin. Please like, subscribe, come back soon, and most importantly, have a great day. Let's go back to Boston, where Beantown harbors the Green Monster, but that's not the only monster that's resided in New England. The other monster was Joe the Animal Barboza. See, the Green Monster is used to intimidate opposing batters from visiting baseball teams. But Joe Barboza was used to intimidate gangsters, criminals, and even other killers. Joe the Animal Barboza was a ruthless hitman and enforcer. It's widely accepted that he took on contract killings for the patriarchal crime family. Originally from New Bedford, Massachusetts, Joe was born September 20th, 1932 to Portuguese parents. His father, Joe Barboza Sr. was at one time a boxer and his mother did seam work. He also had two brothers and a sister. Young Joe eventually followed in his father's footsteps and pursued a career in boxing. He fought in the light heavyweight division under the nickname The Baron before later taking on his now-known polarizing moniker. Ultimately, though, there wasn't a path he tried taking in his early life that didn't eventually lead him to crime. Or maybe he would just take a U-turn back to crime as he seems like someone who welcomed conflict. For example, in his late teens, he helped create a gang called the Cream Puff Bandits, as they vandalized and burglarized stores in their community. Stealing became a habit that Barboza was comfortable with and more so confident in during the 1950s, so much so that it became his favorite trade. Because of his sticky fingers and violent practice, he was eventually sent to prison for robbery, but as we all know, a caged animal can be a dangerous one, and the officers at the Massachusetts Correctional Institute learned that exact lesson. During that stint in prison in 1953, Barboza along with six other inmates attacked multiple guards before escaping the prison in two separate vehicles. Their small stint of freedom lasted all of a night, as they were caught in East Boston the following day. It's believed that Joe Barboza made his connection to the world of organized crime while serving out that prison sentence. Upon release, he soon became a recognizable figure in the streets. He had an already polarizing reputation and now he had a solid crew of thieves working with him. The gang included Tom DePrisco, Nick Furnia, Pat Fabiano, Jim Kearns, Art Bratzos, Joseph and Ron Dermody who were father and son, Carl Eaton, Joe Amico and Ed Goss. The gang was protected by the patriarchal mafia family with Steve, the rifleman Flemmy, acting as the bureaucrat between the two criminal parties. As it's important to remember that non-Italian or Sicilian people could never become official members of a mafia family at the time, as you needed to be full-blooded. Joe Barboza supposedly earned his famous nickname The Animal one night when he was assaulting someone in a night spot. He was warned to stop putting his hands on people, allegedly by an underboss in the New England Mafia. So instead of hitting the man again, he bit the man's face, ripping his cheek off. And it was also said that he proceeded to chew the man's skin, hence mimicking that of a wild animal. For context, I want to acknowledge that I couldn't find any hard-nosed proof of this incident. This was the mid-20th century, so I would say that if you have heard another story, then maybe that may hold weight. The unfortunate part of doing stories like this is that some of the sources were lying degenerates or killers or drug addicts, so it's always a gamble when taking their accounts into consideration. I do my absolute best to weigh sources and I try to find the most common ground. The internet can be a very rinse and repeat place. But if anything, I hope you at least appreciate that I try to be transparent. I know it can get repetitive, but again, every little detail then wasn't recorded on a cell phone and put into a tweet so it can be incredibly hard and frustrating for me 
trying to verify said rumors or people's involvements when speculating on certain history, especially when it's related to criminals. But overall, the violent and unusual cannibalistic behaviors that were associated with them became a consistent stigma attached to Joe as another rumor came and claimed that he once chewed on the fragments of a skull from a headshot he had just popped off. If this is true, then Joe Barboza was every bit of the animal they say he was. I mean that both literally and figuratively, because a normal functioning brain probably won't process those types of behaviors without a subconscious reaction like vomiting or at the minimum gagging. And I'm gonna go ahead and go out on a limb here and say that I don't think Joe the animal, Barboza, was vegan. He probably wasn't vegetarian either. And I also assume the boxing didn't help, as he probably had CTE or some sort of brain damage afterwards as the progression of understanding on those conditions was not very viable back then. Not that that's an excuse to snack on a person after assaulting them or killing them. By adulthood, Barboza was a known contract killer for Raymond Patriarca. There have been several rumors about his victim count but nothing I could verify to an exact number. But I will say that I thoroughly believe it was in the double digits from what I could actually find. Because Joe was truly mammal-like. At times, he was no different than an apex predator hunting for its next meal. He truly had a bloodlust. Another horrid fact about him was his extreme racism. He hated minorities, even though he was one himself, at least in America. Maybe it was his lack of acceptance into the mafia due to his heritage that made him insecure. Or maybe it was just a natural hatred that he harbored. But he certainly bragged about instances where he took the life of someone based only on the color of their skin. Barboza clearly had a habit of assault. As I mentioned earlier, he assaulted guards in prison, and he even went as far as assaulting a police officer later in life, which he served a short sentence for too. Through the 1960s, Barboza's victims piled up. He personally claimed to be responsible for at least 26 deaths during the Boston gang wars between the McLeans and the McLaughlins. In 1964, him and Buddy McLean killed Harold Hannon and Willie Delaney, who were McLaughlin associates. Finally, on October 1965, he killed Ed Punchy McLaughlin, the leader of the rival faction. But in 1966, Barboza's final criminal acts were beginning to play out as he killed both the Hughes brothers and San Lindenbaum too. But soon after, he was arrested for the last time on gun charges. While he was locked up, he reached out to Raymond Patriarca to help him out with his bail. And during that period, he was slowly rejected. Not only was he rejected, but the Patriarca family took over his loan sharking operations and other rackets, leaving the animal locked into a feeling of betrayal. To make matters worse, his two friends and crew members, Arthur C. Bratzos and Thomas J. DePrisco, were killed while raising his bail, which fueled his anger of building resentment towards the New England Mafia as it was now apparent they had turned their back on him and stolen what he considered rightfully his. This infuriated the animal, as he had dished out so much violence to enforce the Patriarca family name, only to get the proverbial slap in the face as payback. Then things took a dramatic turn for the lifelong gangster because in February of 1967, Barbosa's close friend Stephen Fleming was approved as a federal informant for the FBI. And a month later on March 8, 1967, Joe the Animal Barboza decided to follow Flemmy and become a snitch too, as he felt betrayed by the Patriarca family and this was more than a suitable revenge in his eyes. Not only that, but it was also self-serving and something he felt he could use to make an escape out of the criminal life without fatal repercussions for the horrid acts he was guilty of himself. Let's remember, Joe the Animal Barboza was a violent criminal 90% of his life. This isn't a tale of redemption by any means. I wouldn't say there haven't been gangsters who couldn't redeem themselves, but Joe Barboza was irredeemable. He was someone who had no sense of compassion or empathy. His moral compass was beyond shattered. He was a stone-bred monster who enjoyed the fear that followed his legacy, and we will make no mistake about that. Now in 1968, Barboza's lawyer lost a leg after a car bomb went off in retaliation for his client, the FBI's new favorite, Canary. Barboza eventually implicated Raymond Patriarca for the conspiracy to kill a bookie named Willie Marfeo, and that was on top of other implications that led to several convictions of criminal figures in Boston. Afterwards, Joe the Animal became the first person inducted into the Witness Protection Program under a false name in 1975 after he was paroled from prison early for his cooperation. He was sent to Santa Rosa, California. In 1976, though, 
he made a fatal mistake and decided to go and meet with an old criminal associate, that being James Chalmers, who is now residing up in San Francisco. Chalmers told Jerry Angiulo, a New England mobster, and that's when Angiulo sent two mobsters out to California to retaliate against Joe for his witness testimonies. And on February 26th, Iliaro Zanino and Joe Russo pulled up in a van and unleashed a barrage of shotgun shells into the unsuspecting Barboza as he left the house of James Shawmus. The animal, who is now compared to that of only a stool pigeon, was dramatically diminished both in spirit and now body alike. Far past the feared enforcer who once preyed on the streets of Boston, Karma has a way of catching up to everybody. Maybe his nickname the animal was more of a foreshadow to his eventual nature of being nothing more than a rat. Thank you for watching another fascinating dive into the criminal underworld. If you could, please like, subscribe, and come back. Most importantly, have a great rest of your day. Have you ever wondered what would happen if you tried to rob a bank with lemon juice? Well, you won't have to because today... We're going to talk about how two guys did just that, and what followed their crimes wasn't a testament to their genius. In fact, their crimes led to a study, an unflattering one, but we'll get into that a bit later. See, after the darker hour of my last video about the dirtiest dentist in the world, I wanted to go and jump into this lighter, kind of hilarious story about the greater 1995 Pittsburgh bank robberies. I have to be honest. There were times when researching and writing this story that I just couldn't stop laughing. I mean, I, I was cracking up. Look, I'm not here to insult the subjects of this story, but the lack of rationale is at times just too freaking funny. So for context, lemon juice can be used as an invisible ink. You can write on paper with lemon juice, but since it's colorless, you would need to use a hot light bulb to see the message. It's a pretty cut and dry trick. Well. The subjects of this citrus field case, MacArthur Wheeler and Clifton Earl Johnson learned about the invisible ink ability of lemon juice, and what do you know? They decided they were going to become John Cena before John Cena became John Cena by using the lemon juice to make their faces invisible so that they could go and rob some banks while doing so unseen, and no, I'm not lying. And no, it didn't take much convincing for Wheeler to plan out the invisible lemon juice face heist as they tested the invisible masking lemon juice theory with a camera. And since it worked on a picture, that was supposedly enough to convince them with confidence that they had discovered a way to become the ultimate bandits. However, it's been said that the lack of sight from the picture was poor evidence in itself because there were numerous reasons with the camera alone as to why the picture may have come out blank, ranging from light contrast to the aiming of the lens. But there was no convincing Wheeler and Johnson as they had now found a way to stay out of sight, at least in their minds. Also, I personally would like to know why they didn't at least just test the lemon juice on each other to see if they would be invisible to one another. I think Will Ferrell and John C. Riley should make this movie, but it should be a sequel to Step Brothers kind of a thing, you know? It fits right in. See, these two guys thought they found the equivalent of splitting the atom, but for bank robbers. They literally believed they would vanish without a trace, you might say. Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry for the quip, but I had to. I wouldn't say they were men who believed that the devil was in the details, because their eventual plans to rob a couple of banks were simple, as they were going to be invisible, remember? So there was no need for an intricate heist or blueprints and explosives or busting into a vault, nothing like that. Wheeler and Johnson decided they were going to squirt lemon juice on their faces, walk right in, and rob the banks at gunpoint, and because of the juice, no one would be able to see their faces. It would be like getting robbed by the wind. You wouldn't see it coming, and you wouldn't see them going. You would only feel the cool breeze of a barrel demanding the cold hard cash from the register. I mean, how could this fail? Out of all the high stories in history, none seemed as bulletproof as this one. <laughs> <laughs> this is too much fun. I'm sure they felt brilliant as they were going to save $30 on real disguises, instead spending probably only a dollar back then for some good old-fashioned sour lemon juice. In hindsight, the initial investment of their crimes was probably less than a dollar from the both of them outside of their weapons. Plan in place, MacArthur Wheeler and Clifton Earl Johnson decided to finally act on January 6th of 1995. First, they headed towards the Swissvale branch of Mellon Bank, 
faces covered in lemon juice ready to rock and they robbed it at gunpoint for almost $5,500. Then they headed towards the Fidelity Savings Bank in Brighton Heights, loading up with more squirts of lemon to the face before robbing the bank in the exact same manner. However, I couldn't find a consistent total and I do apologize for that. Again, these weren't fancy or violent robberies that turned into pursuits or shootouts, so there isn't much detail to cover there. They literally went in with lemon juice on their bare faces for the cameras to see and capture, and that's exactly what happened aside from the stealing of a little bit of the moolah. Wheeler was almost immediately arrested as his face along with Johnson's were plastered everywhere from all the modern surveillance in the banks that they had just robbed. To their shock and surprise, the lemon juice didn't do its part and now they were going to prison. That lemon juice sure was an unreliable accomplice. Funny enough, and allegedly, when the cops were showing Wheeler pictures and video of himself committing the robberies, he claimed in a surprising tone, but I wore the lemon juice. <laughs> And I, I don't know if that's true, but it sure is hilarious. And Johnson was arrested a few days later. Johnson immediately flipped on Wheeler and testified against him for a more lenient sentence. So not only was Wheeler betrayed by the lemon juice, but support from his partner Clifton Johnson was now as invisible as the ink they were hoping to imitate. Wheeler was sentenced to 24 years in prison, while Johnson served only a little over five because he became a big fat snitch. Now. The media and public were fascinated by their lack of awareness, but two scientists were especially enamored. The curious case of the lemon juice bandits triggered the scientific mind of psychologists David Dunning and Justin Kruger to research the confidence Wheeler had in his lemon juice theory, as they were somewhat baffled that anyone would actually believe that they could use lemon juice as a cloaking device, let alone while in the midst of committing a federal crime. I'm sure some of you have heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect, which I believe states that people with limited info or competence levels can sometimes become so overconfident in an area that they know nothing about only because they discovered some surface information, so they overestimate what they're capable of. I want to be clear that there is obviously more complexity to the Dunning-Kruger effect as a whole. There have been studies since then that have questioned the theory. I'm not a psychoanalyst and I'm certainly not going to try to sound like one. The point and humor of this story to me was that their mini crime spree literally helped inspire a scientific theory about the lack of one's self-awareness and basically how it may lead you to overestimate your abilities. As I said in the beginning, this was incredibly unflattering to become the subject of a theory of such. Thankfully, no one was killed or hurt during the robberies and so this story ultimately turned into an almost comical take on how to not rob a bank. This wasn't a long story as there isn't much detail about the men outside of their ultimate heist plan. The fact that the Dunning-Kruger effect was inspired by Mr. Wheeler was enough for me to have to tell this story. But as always, thank you for stopping by and listening to this story about the 1995 Greater Pittsburgh Bank robberies that ended on a sour note. Please like, subscribe, come back soon, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Hello and welcome back. Now today's story is going to carry a darker tone than usual. Most of the criminal figures I have covered, including in my shorts, are old-fashioned American gangsters that are sometimes easy to romanticize. But today, we won't be talking about any Robin Hood-like figures. Today, we will dive deep down the hole of a true monster. See, some people are born with no other ambition than to be a sadist. That description brings us to Glennon Edward Engelman. Engelman was a one-time military man turned dentist who soon unleashed his true calling as a scam artist con man and contract killer. At first glance, you'd look at this guy and think that he was at the cusp of having the world at his hands. He graduated dental school and tried his hands in entrepreneurship. He seemed like a man with positive ambition, but as we will soon find out, his ambition was driven by a soulless sense of greed and regardless of the prices he may have required for his services. There was no fulfilling his ambition to hurt people. Engelman seemed like your typically successful upper middle class American that had worked their way into a prominent work field. But as we know, he was a hitman too. Not the typical gangland hitter who by their own accords usually are just following orders per se. No, this man was a serial killer and he enjoyed taking people's lives. He just decided to do it for profit and call it a contract hit. But from what I can tell, he was only feeding his hunger for blood. 
Now let's get into the life of Glennon Edward Engelman, who was born on February 6th in 1927. He was raised in a normal family home. They weren't poor or hurting for any necessities. There were no signs during his younger years that he was a psychopath either. In school, he did well and got good grades, and that was before joining the Army Air Corps, which offered benefits under the GI Bill that he eventually used to pay for his dental school. Glennon Engelman also married Edna Ruth Ball in 1953. He attended Washington University in St. Louis where he eventually graduated with a dental degree in 1954. Less than two years later, he divorced his then wife Edna Ball and then married Ida G. Van Hest in 1956. But Edna, his first wife, and Engelman stayed in pretty close contact. From there, he found success as a dentist before then opening up a racing track with his niece-in-law's husband, Eric Frey. What Eric Frey unfortunately didn't know was that his wife Sandy Frey was bumping uglies with the deviant dentist Glennon Engelman behind his back. So yes, Glennon was having an affair with his niece by marriage, and though it's not incest, it still gives me a weird feeling to think about having a relationship with somebody in my family. But, I don't know, maybe that's just me, but I hope not. That's not the only horrible thing that Glennon did to Eric, but we'll get into that shortly. Now, let's get into his first known victim. Edna Ruth Ball had remarried since her first marriage to Glennon. Now she was married to a man named James Bullock. James was a hard-working man, and he had a job in the Missouri electric field. He was also a student, attempting to propel him and his wife into a more financially stable lifestyle. But that wasn't good enough for Edna Ruth, though. As she had decided within the first few months of her second marriage that she wanted a large sum of money, and she decided the easiest way to get it was to have her husband James killed for the insurance payout. From there, Edna made it clear to Glennon that he would get a portion of the money if he killed James Bullock. And sadly enough, that all but sealed the fate of the unsuspecting but hardworking husband. And by the end of 1958, James Bullock's body was discovered with a fatal gunshot wound from a small caliber handgun not far from the art museum in St. Louis. Glennon Engelman was now officially a contract killer. Aside from finding a new profession he was comfortable with, he believed that manipulating people into allowing him to kill their significant others for insurance money was a great motive. It was his cherry on top. He would get to feed his hunger for blood, and he would ultimately profit from it as well. In 1963, the dentist would strike again. Eric Frey, the husband of his then-niece and lover, Sandy Frey was working with Glenn Engelman on a construction project in relation to their racing track business. One day while on the site, Glennon assaulted Eric Frey with a rock before dumping his body into a well and dropping explosives down to cover his tracks and make it look like it was an accident, which in itself is just horrid and a shocking crime. Again, he was gifted a portion of the insurance payout from Sandy Frey, his lover. He used his money from Eric's death and invested it into the racing track. That wasn't enough though, because in 1964, Glennon had to file bankruptcy on the racing track and eventually went back to being a dentist full time. Let's go about a decade down the road where in 1976, his childhood friend and one time dental associate Miranda Holm eventually decided that it would be in her favor too for Glennon Engelman to take the life of her husband for an insurance payout as Glennon was considered charming. He had a way of manipulating people, especially women. It's said he would manipulate these women into killing their spouses but it's also hard for me to believe that they did this only due to his idea. You have to be a terrible person as is one way or another to be convinced to kill a spouse or any innocent person for that matter. So it was negotiated that Glennon would take out Miranda's husband, Peter Holm. In a horrible setup, Miranda coerced her husband, Peter, to take her out to a pond around the city of Pacific, Missouri. While they were standing next to one another, Peter was shot once from behind with a rifle by Glennon ending his life, next to the scoundrel that helped orchestrate his assassination. Which is just cold, that, that's soulless. Glennon Engelman had an accomplice that day he executed Peter Holm with, and that man was named Robert Handy. By 1977, Glennon was having an affair with another married woman named Barbara Boyle, who was married to Ron Goosewell. Follow me on this one, okay? See. Barbara had found out that Ron's parents had an estate worth several hundred thousand dollars as they owned an oil business, which Ron would be the sole heir to. Barbara was greedy and she had to have it. 
so she conspired with Glennon and another man to have Ron's parents killed. In 1977, Glennon traveled up to the farmhouse that Vanita and Arthur Goosewell lived, which were Ron's parents, and he viciously took both of their lives. Again, I want to emphasize how disgustingly evil and greedy Barbara is, because after ordering the death of Ron's parents, she moved on to Ron and had him killed a year and a half later in East St. Louis because she found out his estate was also worth several hundred thousand dollars as well. For context, the police were aware of Glenn Engelman and believed he was a prime suspect, as it obviously wasn't a coincidence to law enforcement as he was a consistently related piece that surrounded so many deaths. Finally, in 1980, the walls were creeping in on the devilish dentist, but not soon enough for the last but unfortunate victim, Sophia Barrera. Glenn and Engelman had borrowed money from Sophia, who was also in the dental industry, but he failed to pay her back. With the non-payments piling up, Sophia was forced to sue Glennon and sadly enough, he sought out his revenge by planting a car bomb in her vehicle, tragically taking another life. After the death of Sophia Barrera, one of Engelman's ex-wives, his third wife to be exact, approach law enforcement and help bust the case open against the one-time dental student now turned insurance fraudster and hitman. Glennon Engelman was soon arrested and by 1985, he was connected to multiple crimes which he was undoubtedly convicted for. Those crimes ranging from fraud charges to capital M-U-R-D-E-R. -E YouTube does not like the M word in case you've wondered why I dance around it so much. Sorry, I really am, but it, they don't like it. And finally, Glennon, the demonic dentist, was locked up, and so were all the accomplices he had orchestrated and committed so many heinous crimes with. One of the sentences he received was life without parole, which kept him caged like the animal he was until his death in March of 1999. He rotted in prison like the sugar-ridden teeth he was once so familiar with. And personally, I hope he suffered every single moment of his life in prison. The sad part about this story isn't the cliché potential he could have had as a normal, hard-working dental profession. It's the loss of life. Each one of his victims were honest, hard-working people. They weren't gangsters or criminals who made their own beds. They were innocent people living out their vision of the American dream. A dream that was fatefully derailed into a nightmare every time Glenn and Engelman showed up. I hope the families of the victims found at minimum some peace with his convictions. If you have any feelings or input, I would love to hear it in the comments section down below, but please be respectful. Thank you for joining me again, this time after finding another reason to not enjoy the dental office. Please like, subscribe, come back soon, and most importantly, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Hello and welcome back. Today I'd like to know what's not to love about Canada. I mean, they got great geographical landscapes, maple syrup, hockey, and mob hits. You know, basically something for everybody. Outside of us, the criminal history community, I'm not sure everyone associates organized crime with Canada as much as we do, but Canada has a whole smorgasbord of interesting and polarizing criminal figures, and today, we're going to explore one of their nastiest mobsters. A man who was known for taking hits without bias, and that man was Salvatore Calati. He was dispersed between multiple families. I tried and tried, but I could not find an exact, accurate birth date for Salvatore. But he was born in 1971 or very early 1972. In fact, I scoured several sources with info on him, and it did not lay out much before his involvement in organized crime. There isn't much to go on regarding his younger years and upbringing. As always, if you happen to have some info, please send it my way. I would be appreciative of that, as I'm always thankful for some enlightenment. As far as I could find, he started his criminal ventures in his teenage years when he became somewhat of a debt collector for the Canadian mob in the Toronto and the Woodbridge areas. Even during his teen years, he wasn't massive by any means, but he was stout with a temper that could rival that of a starved lion. That alone made him stand out to the older and more experienced individuals who understood that in order to survive in that underworld, you must be comfortable with extreme acts of violence and obviously, Sal was more than capable and willing. After settling into adulthood, Sal wound up with three children of his own. He also established himself in the food industry, opening his own restaurant business. However, 
Sal was known to rip off suppliers and creditors as he had a habit of not paying his bills. Not only that, but when confronted with non-illicit debts, he would threaten everyday citizens whom he did business with, which obviously added to his greedy and violent reputation both in the criminal and the professional world. It's safe to say he probably wasn't picking up the tab for anybody. He wasn't empathetic and he certainly didn't believe in incentive. He is not someone that I would have tipped either. You know, scratch his back but he'll shoot you in yours kind of a thing. So word around town is that Sal is stiff you and he might kill you if confronted. And by the 1990s, there was little to no doubt about his reputation as he was now a known killer. Salvatore Collati wasn't loyal to one family. He was loyal to money, which helped feed his degenerate gambling habits. And because of that, he worked for whoever wanted to pay him and he killed whoever he was paid to kill. There wasn't much of a gray area to him. If someone from one of the families wanted someone else to go away, well they knew they had an ace in the hole who would take the hit without any discrimination or opposition. And you know what? I think that gets lost in mob lore on TV and film sometimes, that these guys really weren't loyal. As much as I've read and heard about Omerta, I've also read and heard about just as many guys turning state's evidence against their so-called friends and associates or killing them. I think that's pretty consistent a lot of gang culture in general. I mean, you watch the first 48, and the guy that probably swore he would never say a word starts crying as soon as he gets put in an interview room over a crime he was involved in. I'm also not saying people can't feel guilt or remorse. But I am saying that the deeper I've dug into criminal history through all landscapes, not just mafias and gangs, but all criminal types snitch and show no loyalty when things are no longer in benefit to them. That's a massive part of the criminal personality that I've picked up on. And maybe that's a subjective opinion of my own, but honestly I've seen it too. For quick context, I certainly wasn't innocent my whole life. But I'm not going to try and sell you this idea that I was the baddest guy around or a gang member or a hardened gangster, but I made mistakes. Some of the guys I grew up around were very violent and criminally motivated individuals, but I never got that deep into things. I committed petty crimes until I was around 22 years old. I grew up around guys that were far worse than me. And I'm no longer friends with a single one of them anymore that stuck to that lifestyle, ultimately because they're selfish, not because I think I'm better than who I used to be or where I came from. I knew a guy real well who was a career criminal and now he's serving life sentences after executing someone close to him all because he didn't get his way as he wanted to see people on his level and this was after getting people arrested by just being present with him in other instances. I won't go into any more details as I'm still close to some of the people that were affected by this guy. I've also known plenty of people that wanted nothing to do with me anymore once I had a child and began living a so-called straight and narrow life too and guess what, I'm perfectly fine with that. See, most of the money I ever earned through cutting corners the illicit way wound up going to lawyers, court fees, and government forced probationary programs. That fast money will be gone just as fast as it came in, at least in my experiences. Anyways, that's a little bit about me, but back to our neighbor from the north's very own accomplished hitman, Salvatore Collati. So again, by the 90s, Sal was doing hits and folks were getting clipped like loose paper. In 1991, one of his most high-profile executions took place. A man named Giovanni Costa, who wasn't a criminal or a major player in the Canadian Mafia and drug trade, wound up his victim. See, Costa's family was involved in a drug war with the rival Camisio family, who were originally getting along until they both decided they wanted full control of the trafficking pipelines. Because of that, Giovanni Costa, 38, was shot dead near his home allegedly by Sal Calati and possibly an accomplice around the Thornhill area. He was basically just a residual tragic casualty of war. The feud originally began when the younger brother of Giovanni, Luciano Costa, broke into the house of a rival mobster, both stealing weapons and taking a leak all over his bed, which ultimately led to the previous deaths of two other Costa brothers. This information came directly from Giuseppe Costa, brother of those previously mentioned who was interviewed in a maximum security prison. Later, in 1996, Sal was suspected in the execution of Francesco Luiero, who owned a Toronto bakery. See, Carmine Guido, who was a mobster and informant, had some recordings that implicated Salvatore Collati in the death of Francesco. Guido had a taped conversation with Pino Asino, in which Asino said that he warned Francesco not to press and bother Salvatore Collati, even though Collati scammed thousands of dollars away from someone related to Francesco. Francesco didn't listen, and he confronted Sal. 
while also trying to intimidate him, ultimately leading to his own death. In 1997, Giuseppe Congiesta was killed, and again, Collati was suspected and even arrested and charged. But he was eventually acquitted after a witness gave a different description of someone that didn't look like Sal Collati. Salvatore had been suspected in multiple murders, and yet there was never any charges that were able to stick, as he was also suspected in the hit of Gatano Pimpinto. Finally, in 2010, one of the most infamous mob hits in Canadian history was set in motion. Nicolo Rizzuto, alleged boss of the Rizzuto crime family, was standing in his home on the afternoon of November 10th, 2010, when a bullet from a sniper was fired, striking him and ultimately leading to the end of his life. That hit, too, was also suspected to be the work of Salvatore Collati. It's widely alleged that Sal bragged about being involved with the hit in Nicolo Rizzuto, but again, he was never found guilty of anything related to the hits he was involved in. But 2013 itself brought on the inevitable as Salvatore Collati ran into karma. On July 12th, overnight at a banquet hall, Collati and his associate James Tusk were near their vehicle and they were shot multiple times at close range. Due to Sal's history of being a paranoid killer, police believed that Sal knew the shooter or shooters as they didn't appear to be a struggle and it was also hard to sneak up on someone like Sal due to his prepared nature. Their bodies were discovered rather quickly, but the killer or killers were never found and identified. However, it is widely believed that it was revenge ordered by Vito Rizzuto over the death of his father, especially since Sal Collati loved telling people he was responsible for the hit. It's no surprise that this story ended with the central character receiving a toe tag and matching body bag. Sal was a violent man who clearly had problems with impulse. He liked to gamble, and when he lost, he would borrow money and punish those who attempted to settle debts. As I said earlier, he also did this to non-illicit business associates in the restaurant world any time he didn't want to pay for his orders. By the time he was killed, he had no allegiance and there was no loyalty to him either. His funeral didn't garner the usual mob attendance as it's perceived that he had burned too many bridges and no mobsters wanted to be associated with him anymore. He died a violent and somewhat lonely death, which is typical for those who believe it's their duty to play God with the lives of others. As always, thank you for stopping by for another walk into the world of one of the more violent Canadian gangsters, Sal Kalati. If you have any thoughts or feelings, please let me know down below, but I ask that you do so respectfully. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, come back soon, and have a great rest of your day. Hello, and thank you for stopping by. Today's subjects are what movies are made of, because these guys were at one time stars in the bank robbing field before taking an eventual darker turn. I don't mean to glorify anyone, but they liked the action as much as Bruce Willis, and that's what makes the reputation of the Boyd Gang stand out historically in the world of stick-up men. The Boyd Gang loved money, they loved robbing, and they loved having a generally good time by their standards. Their name was derived from the media's love for the Hollywood-looking fearless and always eager Edwin Alonzo Boyd, who was proclaimed as their leader. However, it's said that the brainiac and organizing factor was in fact another member of the gang named Lenny Jackson. I couldn't help but feel like it was rightfully named after Boyd himself. You'll see why. Aside from Lenny and Edwin, the gang also included a man named Valent Lesso, who went by the alias of Steve as well as another gentleman named Willie Jackson, who had no relation whatsoever to Lenny. I want to clear that up from the get-go. From what I could find, these guys originally met in the Don Jailhouse, which is in Canada, in the year 1951. I ask that you bear with me as I could not find details for every single robbery, but we will certainly dive into their most notorious robberies as these guys were running rampant during the middle of the 20th century. Anyways, Edwin Boyd was from Canada. Born in 1914 and ironically, his father wound up working for the Toronto Police Department. While in school, Edwin kept himself busy with after-school activities and music and band, though he never really excelled from an academic standpoint. By 1933, he was arrested for the first time, leading to a short stint in jail, and in 1936, he attempted to rob a store, but he failed. He soon was enlisted into the Royal Canadian Regiment, which is a branch of their army. While stationed overseas, he met his eventual wife, Doreen Mary Frances Thompson, who had a secret first child that she hid from Edwin in the beginning. 
Edwin, though, came to adopt her first child after he was introduced. Then, they had a child together almost a year later, but tragically, they lost their newborn son during an air raid that critically injured their infant. Soon after, Edwin Boyd transferred over to the Canadian Provost Corps in 1942 before successfully having twins with his wife a year later. Finally, in 1945, he was discharged from the service after the war ended. By the late 1940s, Edwin Boyd and his wife were back living in Canada where Boyd struggled to find a good job to provide for his wife and young children. Ultimately, Edwin Alonzo Boyd decided that by any means necessary, he was going to put food on the table for his family, even if that meant turning to crime. On September 9th, 1949, he made a decision that you can't come back from, a decision that could potentially lead to multiple convictions and a long sentence behind bars. That decision was to rob a bank, and that bank was a branch of the Bank of Montreal for a grand total of $2,256, which was by no means chump change back in the 1940s. See, he was pretty confident in his robbing skills because of his military and motorcycle riding experience. He considered himself someone who enjoyed indulging in more adrenaline-driven activities, so bank robbing was going to be right up his alley. In hindsight, he had just fought in one of the largest world wars in history. He had already suffered horrible and personal tragedies, so in a sense, he probably felt things could obviously be much worse than the potential of being arrested. So to him, the risk was probably worth it. As tough as he was, he still decided to have a couple of alcoholic beverages before partaking in his first robbery because he had the first time jitters. So, a little buzzed, he walked into the bank pulled out his Luger from the war after handing over a note declaring that this was in fact a good old-fashioned stick-up. As he was running out of the Bank of Montreal, the manager began a foot pursuit after Edwin, but he got away. And by the time the police were passing by him, he had discarded his simple disguise of makeup. Then in 1950, Edwin wound up on the stroll again looking for a new bank to rob, this time with more prior effort and planning hoping things would go smooth from start to finish, from stick up to getaway. This time his victim was a branch of the Canadian Bank of Commerce. He followed the same procedure of robbery though, simply handing over a note as he brandished his prized German Luger. Now adding a little bit more of his own antics, jumping on the counter, being a little bit more demanding. His total cash break was a little more than the last haul at a total of $2,862. After a couple successful robberies, he reluctantly told his wife, but she was accepting of it. And by the middle of the year, he saddled up and robbed the Dominion Bank for a little of over $2,000. Later that year, he wound up trying to rob another bank in North York, but the bank manager intervened and got hold of his gun. Edwin Boyd had to charge that attempt to the game as he got away with nothing, not a single dollar. In fact, he was lucky to escape with his life because the bank manager turned into Dirty Harry and started ringing off shots at Edwin after he wrestled away possession of the pistol. Barely a year later, after he originally started his bank robbing spree, he returned to the scene of his first major crime. He returned to the Bank of Montreal to rob it once again. After a while, he met a degenerate alcoholic named Howard Galt. They became friends. Together, along with his younger brother Norman Boyd, the three went and robbed another bank for a total close to $10,000. And obviously during that era, that was a nice cash grab. Unfortunately for Edwin, Howard was not built with the same composure that Edwin was, and Edwin was about to fall victim to the incompetent of Mr. Gold. They decided to rob yet another bank, and after settling without a serious plan in place, they ran in and to the surprise of Edwin, Howard started going crazy. He became erratic, and by the time Edwin had convinced Howard to flee, the police were on the way. Edwin was able to escape at first, but Howard was snatched up like a puppy by its neck and started barking off details about his former friend Edwin Boyd. Edwin was soon arrested and confessed to his part in multiple robberies. He was sent to the Dawn Jail, which was a notorious and dangerous Canadian detention center before it was closed in 1977. While in jail, Edwin Alonzo met Lenny and Willie, both whom were violent thieves themselves. Almost instantly, they began trading stories one important detail about Lenny was that Lenny had a fake false foot which he would store saw blades inside of. A little bit of context for later. 
The three decided they should break out of jail together and on November 4th, 1951, they set their plan in motion, sawed out some window bars and scaled down the side. Their plan involved them being picked up by the earlier mentioned Steve, but he was nowhere to be found before ultimately showing up late. It didn't take long for the convicts to plan and execute a couple of bank robberies, one a Bank of Toronto and the other one a Leaside Royal Bank. However, the police were looking for them already for their escape and had assumed it was them that had committed the above mentioned two robberies. It is important to note that the gang as a whole, they did not like each other. There was jealousy. Most of the guys seemed to have a superiority complex in one way or another. They all cared about their reputations, both personally and in the description the media was displaying about them. Willie was eventually arrested, but he kept his mouth shut. Afterwards, Willie had a younger brother who joined up with the gang, and his name was Joe. The gang was now mainly Edwin, Steve, and the younger brother of Willie. They robbed a bank together. Then they robbed another bank, this time with Steve's girlfriend, a woman named Mary. What they didn't know, though, was that Mary was a snitch, even though she was related to Lenny. She was informing to the police. She told the police about their getaway car, which belonged to the mother of Steve's child the true love of Steve's life, a woman named Anna. On a fateful day, Lenny and Steve were driving and tragically, because of the information that Mary had shared with the police, a Detective Tong and Sergeant Perry were patrolling the streets when they spotted the supposed getaway car. They pulled them over and as Detective Tong approached the black car, shots were fired from the car, striking Tong in the chest, critically injuring him and striking Perry in his arm. The thieves got away and the policemen were rushed to the hospital where Tong sadly passed away. After fleeing, Mary tipped off the police about Steve. The police raided Steve's apartment and shot him, but it wasn't fatal. Lenny was also found in an apartment, but Lenny got into a shootout with police. They wounded Lenny multiple times before his pregnant wife talked him into surrendering. Finally, a detective with known integrity Adolphus Payne set his sights on the last known member of the Boyd gang, Edwin himself. Through grimy and time-consuming detective work, Adolphus Payne was able to discover a vehicle that was transferred to Edwin Boyd's wife from Norman, unwittingly. Norman and his wife were attempting to sell the car, and as fate would have it, the detective called the ad for the car and wound up speaking to Norman. The police said they were interested in purchasing the car, so they said they would only purchase it from the original owner of the car, that being Edwin's wife, Doreen. So Doreen came over, got a fake check that was setting up the plan so they could get to Edwin. And it was successful as Doreen went and picked up Edwin afterwards and the police surveilled them. They found where Edwin was being harbored and on March 15th, 1952, the police raided the house during the early morning hours. Edwin was arrested without any violent altercations. The whole gang was now convicted, including good old Mary the Singing Canary, as her snitching didn't give her immunity. By the order of their justice system, the original members of the gang were in prison together again. The whole gang was back together, you could say. Edwin, Lenny, Steve, and Willie. To nobody's surprise, they followed the same historical road as before and planned an intricate prison break. This time, on September 8th, 1952, the gang escaped and forged into the Don Valley. And for a little context, the guards did take Lenny's fake foot this time, so he had to run through the wilderness with a cup over his stump. He really was tough and persistent, though I'll give him that. Somehow or another, Steve left the gang for a bit and came back with a new foot for Lenny. And I, listen... If, if you could go and find a false foot for your friend in that time period, I mean, hell, even in this time period, hey, you're a great friend. So let's give Steve some kudos. Anyways, he brought Lenny his new foot, and then he brought some weapons and new clothes for everyone. But as luck would have it, some farmers saw them tracking and mistook them for homeless people and reported them out of suspicion. The police showed up to a barn, and without alarming the criminals, caught them without any more further violence. They were immediately put on trial, and by the end of 1952, Lenny and Steve were hanged over the death of Detective Tong. Edwin was eventually released for good behavior in 1966. Before his death in 2002, 
Edwin confessed sadly that he had killed two people before robbing banks, but the police couldn't get an investigation done before his passing. I hope you all enjoyed this story. I truly hope that the victims of their crimes found peace. I also want to clarify that I would never glorify the actions of criminals, but their story is exactly what you would typically want from a good bank robbing movie. Sadly, this wasn't film or fiction and people lost their lives. Thank you for stopping by, and if you could, please like, subscribe, come back, and have a wonderful rest of your day.